Well, thank you everybody for turning out tonight. I'm really flattered that so many people came on the, the call and to listen to me. Um, I see a lot of names and of friends out there that that I know and so many names of people, frankly, who have helped me with the column over the years, which has been so important, not only with expert advice and commentary, but also photographs. It's um, your contributions are so meaningful and I really couldn't do this without, <clears throat> excuse me, without a lot of help. So I appreciate that. And um, this really has been a labor of love for not quite 20 years, actually. This is the beginning of the 20th year. So um, I thought I would start tonight and talk for a moment about a survey I saw in the latest, well, not the latest, but a very recent issue of Birdwatching Magazine. Some of you might receive that. There was a survey in there of, of uh, over 5,000 birders and they were asked which of 18 actions they took over the previous 12 months. And I've listed just a few of the choices here. Made my yard more desirable for birds, used eBird, led bird walks, contributed to conservation organizations, participated in a CBC. Those were just five of the 18 choices. And the findings said that almost 100% of those birders took at least one action. And the average number of actions was eight. So it, it shows you that birders are really engaged and certainly the ones who belong to the DuPage Birding Club are. I know most of you have, if you, if you haven't engaged in eight of those actions, you've probably done even more. But what I thought was interesting, at least personally, is at the very end of that list, the least popular action <laughs> was road editorials to the newspaper, articles for magazines, content for blogs and so forth. That was the least popular thing. Only 14% of the respondents actually did that. Well, I give you that information just as a matter of context um, to the to what I'm going to present tonight. And as I said, it's it really has been the labor of love, and it all started in 2003. That's a CAT scan of my head, and it really did start with an idea I had based on um, we were receiving this weekly newspaper called the Glen Ellen News. It was a free paper that appeared on our driveway every Wednesday. It was part of a group of newspapers. Uh, the Wheaton Leader was in that group. I think the Downers Grove Reporter was another newspaper in that group. It was called the Liberty Suburban Newspaper Group. Anyway, I'd been noticing a lot of articles in, in that paper about pets, dogs, cats, and whatnot. I thought, you know, this newspaper, they could really stand to have a column about birds. You know, it's a popular activity and they had nothing about birds. So I pitched the idea to the editor, gave him a list of, you know, potential topics, things I would write about. And he said, great, let's do it. He said, yes. So I was really happy about that. And suddenly I had to start writing. But this is what I wanted to do. I've, you know, in my work at the time, I was doing a lot of writing. In fact, in a past life, I even wrote articles about beer and soft drinks and dairy products. So, you know, I was accustomed to writing articles. It had always been part of my job. And now I got to apply it to something really fun. So I began to write. And this was the very first column right here. My screen is partially blocked by all the pictures on the right. Let me see if I can. Uh... There, that's better. We can see it fine, Joe. OK. Yeah, for me, I was couldn't see the full screen. Now I can. not So the first column, this was January 2004. Maybe not the most original headline, but 
That's what I called it. And I'm going to be showing you some shots like this of past columns. Don't panic. I'm not expecting you to read anything beyond the headline. <laughs> but that's the first one, short and sweet. And this is kind of what that first column said. And I, I make these points because these five points have sort of carried through in the columns I've written ever since. It's almost everything I do incorporates one or more of these concepts. That birding is simple, that it's easy to get started. It's convenient. You can do it from home when you're driving. Well, not too much when you're driving, but you know, you can do it from anywhere. It's one of the things I certainly love about it. And birding is challenging if you want it to be. If you don't want it to be, it's, it might just be a matter of looking out your kitchen window and watching the bird feeders. If you do that, you're a birder too. Birding is full of surprises. And that's where that headline about the box of chocolates comes from. And finally, birding brings us closer to nature. These are you know, some of the advantages and attractions of birding or bird watching that I pointed out in that very first column. And of course, it wasn't too long after that, maybe a couple months that I had to write about what got me started. Everybody has a spark bird, or I think most people do. Mine was the hooded warbler, a bird I saw down at Kiowa Island in South Carolina back in the early 90s. And that really rekindled a, an interest I had in birds from the time I was a, was a boy. But I, I mark the early 90s as sort of my start as a serious birder. And uh, this was a column about that. And notice this, this column and the others in the uh, Glen Ellen News were very short. This, this was not a long column compared to the ones I'm putting out there now. Well, part of the reason for that, oh, by the way, here's that hooded warbler, not the actual one I saw, but the one that was in that column in black and white, unfortunately. But these columns, they almost had to be short because the agreement was I'd write for the Glen Island News once a month. Well, about two or three weeks into it, the editor called and said, can you give us a column every two weeks? <laughs> so suddenly my, my workload doubled, but they were short columns and I, I had a, a pretty good reservoir of topic ideas, so it wasn't a problem. My early columns focused a lot on yard birding and, and watching feeders and seeing what you can see out your back door, because let's face it, that's what most people who are interested in birds, um, that's how they get started. And that may be where they stay. They may not be interested in going out in the field and doing bird walks, which is okay. So I kept the, the focus kind of close to home. Lots of information about feeders. And um, this was a story actually in 2005. This was about Bob and Karen Fisher's backyard, which most of us know about the yard in Downers Grove. One story here, this I can see was before Bob actually got over 200 species in his yard. It says, um, I think he was just a couple short of 200 at this point but I know he's gone over 200 since then. I wrote about bird clubs, focusing mostly on the DBC and Kane County Audubon. I even wrote about butterflies. <laughs> this one was triggered by a visit by Ken Kaufman to the Morton Arboretum. Ken had just come out with a book, a field guide for butterflies. And I went down to the Arb to listen to him, have him sign my book. And notice too, not only are these columns quite short, um, other than that one with the hooded warbler, they don't have any pictures. Well, 2007 was a transition year because um, sure enough, the Liberty Suburban Newspaper Group went out of business where they sold out. I think that happened in 20, early 2007. So for the rest of that year, I continued to write, but I just posted my writings on my blog, which 
is also called Words on Birds. It was a place to keep writing and, and posting, even though my column didn't have a home in any particular newspaper. This is what the, uh, the blog looks like today. Anybody can go there and it's, um, all I use it for is as a reservoir for the columns. So if you don't get the Daily Herald or you can't go online for it, you can always go to wordsonbirds.com and see the latest column as well as all the other columns I've ever written. So 2007, yeah, everything I was putting out was on this uh, website. But then in 2008, I was saved by the Daily Herald. I can't really remember if I approached them. Chances are I did, or if they sought me out. But um, I think I went to them, and they they liked what I'd been doing with the Glen Ellen News and the other papers. And um, they said, sure, let's try it out. And they gave me a place in their neighbor section. Well, this was a really big break because, you know, with the Glen Ellen News, that was, that was once a week, tiny audience. Um, really low minor leagues if to use a baseball analogy and then stepping up to the daily herald was was a lot closer to the major leagues more readers um a good presence in print and online as well i didn't have that online presence with the smaller papers lots more space for words and pictures color pictures Total editorial freedom, which I kind of had before. And what I mean by that is no pressure to write about any particular thing. I choose my topics and, um, you know, I could write about whatever I want. And no set deadlines, um, which is really nice because, as I said before, this isn't my real job, at least, um, you know. And back then I was super busy, not a whole lot of time to write about birds. So it helped not to have that pressure. The agreement there was once a month and that's pretty much what it's been ever since. Now, what to write about? Um, it's a question I get a lot. Do you ever run out of topics or how do you decide what to write about? I've never really had a problem coming up with topics. And as it says on the top of my blog page, the column is really about three things, birds, birding, and birders. And almost every column is about at least two of those things, but they're different. They're slightly different, but um, a lot of columns cover all three of those things. So for this presentation, I was looking back, looking back to, um, across 20 years of columns and I, I kind of categorized them and came up with these six bullets about most of the columns fit into these bullets. Either it's a species of bird or a family of birds, stories that just pop up and I'll, I'll give you examples of all of these, stories about people I've met, some local, some with national reputations, then there's the columns about birding, how to bird, tips, um, information such as where to go birding, diary entries, I'll explain that in a bit. And then the birding year in review, which was um, something I started with the Daily Herald when I moved into that paper in 08. Each year since then has ended with kind of a massive recap of, of the year in birding. And those columns have been pretty popular. So that first category, birds and bird families, um, here's a few early examples, sandhill cranes. I remember this, this was a, I won't talk too long about each of these columns, but I remember this one for having said, I went to the Platte River in Nebraska and that's where I actually saw my first sandhill crane. I guess I hadn't been birding that long because, you know, now we see them flying over DuPage County all the time in the spring and the fall. But it wasn't really the case back in the 19, I don't know, um, 90s, early 2000s. That was not a common event. At least I didn't see them. 
wrote about nighthawks, of course. And here's a here's an example of uh, it's a column about tanagers that was triggered by one particular sighting of a summer tanager at Cantini. So I know in this, you know, in in this group, summer tanager may not be that special, but it was special for me being at Cantini and is the first one I'd ever seen here at the park. And um, you know, I could have written in all about summer tanagers, but I thought that's a good springboard to write about tanagers in general. And that gave me a chance to talk about the Western tanagers that have been seen in this region a few times in the last few years, seems like a little more than usual. And of course the scarlet tanager that everybody knows. And I'm just gonna show you some of the outstanding birds and the outstanding photos that have run as I, um, to illustrate, not all these birds received a full column, but they were at least featured in the year end column. Um, this was a sage thrasher down in Chicago at Montrose in 2011. It was the fifth Illinois record. There have been some sage thrashers since then. I know either this year, I mean, either last year or the year before, I think there was one down at Northerly Island and probably a few more in between since 2011. But I think of all the photos I've ever had shared with me, this is, this is one of my all time favorites. Jerry Goldner took this shot at Montrose. This was the common ringed plover. And, and some of you probably chased these birds and, and I didn't necessarily see them all, definitely did not. Um, but you guys may remember this when September, 2016, over in Kankakee, common ringed plover. And this was the first ever of that species in Illinois, recorded in Illinois. This was the Lewis's woodpecker down by Effingham. I know a bunch of you went down there to see this one. It was at a nature center. This was May, 2019. It's a bird I really wanna see someday. I did not make it down there. But that's one of the fun things about this column is even when I don't get to go chase a really special bird that I would like to go see, I get to live it sort of vicariously just by following what everybody else is doing and you know, taking careful notes and following up on things. Sometimes I almost feel like I've been there and, and actually did go see the bird, but being there is the best. And um, for those of you who got to see this one, I'm, I'm really happy for you. I think it might've been the first re record in Illinois. I can't remember. This was the ancient murrelet down at Montrose in November, 2019. And Mike Carroll shared this photo with me. For Montrose, my notes say this was the number uh, 347th species at Montrose. You know, one had never been seen there. Very, very unlikely bird and, and quite a remarkable photo too. This was also in Montrose, same month, November, 2019, a King Eider. And uh, I don't know if it was 2019 or the next year, but I wrote a column about November rarities. It turns out November in this region is really kind of famous for rare birds. This is a cool photo that Jody Zamorowski let me use Obviously that's a whooping crane in the middle of a flock of sandhill cranes. And I know a lot of you have probably seen this site. I never have, but every time the sandies fly over, especially when I'm out in my yard or on the driveway, I always look for the white crane because I want that bird on my yard list badly. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. And just a few remarkable hummingbird sightings from 2021 and this was the magnificent hummingbird at Labaw Woods in the month of May. Matt Meiswich took this photo and he took this photo as well. It's the Mexican violet ear 
in Mundelein, also to 2021 in August. Amazing photo, amazing bird. Matt also took this photo, and I know a bunch of you went to see this bird down in uh, Shanahan, the great Kiskadi, first ever in Illinois. This was December 2020. Another amazing picture that ran in the Daily Herald. And you know, I should say something about audience. The people reading the Herald, I have to assume they're those who are reading the column care about birds and they have an interest. But I know that very, very few of them are serious, hardcore birders. But I've, I've, I keep that in mind, of course. But I, at the same time, I'm not shy about dropping birder jargon or showing rare birds or, uh, you know, using terms like mega, talking about stakeouts. Um, you know, I think the readers kind of get a kick out of that stuff. They, it, it gives them a sense of how serious our hobby really is and all the, you know, how tight knit the community is and what what we will do to go see an unusual bird. I think that's, that's part of the fun when I put the columns together. And I think um, generally people are enjoying that based on the feedback I get. This is the ivory gall that was down in Quincy. I actually did chase this bird, photo by Jackie Bowman, by the way, who provides a lot of great photos for me. This was the third record in Illinois, but I got there too late. I did not see the bird. I didn't go there specifically for the bird. My daughter at the time was in college at Augustana, so I had I was taking her back to school anyway. Then I took a southerly detour just in case the bird was still around, but but I was too late. Still fun looking for it, though. Then Bonnie Graham took this photo just a few months ago over at the Indiana Dunes. The fork-tailed flycatcher. I mean, what a spectacular bird. And this one ran in my year-end column in December, this photo. Thank you, Bonnie. So what about pop-up stories? Um, these are the ones that just, you know, at any given time, I think I have some good column ideas floating around in my head, but invariably a story comes up and I just have to write about it and, and whatever I had planned, I put on hold because some of the pop-up stories are just really, really good. They come out of nowhere. This is a good example. A lot of you probably went down to Moni, to the, uh, uh, where was this? The um, the exit off of 57, I believe. Yeah, I-57 down by Moni. Anyway, Doug Stotts discovered this great-tailed grackle. And this bird stayed in that same general area by a gas station in a, the Amazon warehouse for a long time. Um, very accessible bird. Most people who went to find it got to see it. And, um, you know, this just made a good story. And um, I, it was fun to share it because it's the little details about a, a bird like this that kind of hangs out at a gas station eating fast food scraps and takes a break goes over to the Amazon warehouse and hangs out there for a while. And, you know, it's the dead of winter, so you can sort of cruise around in these parking lots without getting out of your car looking for it. Kind of a stakeout type of situation. And uh, I have to point out, Jake Savitas took that picture. It's, it's really outstanding, and I was so happy shared it with me because it's eye level and the colors and the one foot up in the air. I just love that picture. Here's another pop-up story that was fun. Um, here at Cantini, and I am at Cantini right now because the interconnect, internet connection's better. <laughs> but across the way at the First Division Museum, they came across 
in, in some of their files, I don't know what it was doing there, but they found an old birding checklist um, from a birder who used to go bird watching here regular. And you could tell by her checklist, by all the notations and data, that she was a serious birder. And her list that we found was from 1977. And I saw that and immediately noticed the difference between the birds she was checking off and the ones we've been checking off here, you know, in the last 10 years. Huge difference. So that's what this column was about. You know, not that long ago, really, 1977, but how things have changed. And, and a lot of that is because the uh, the habitat here has changed. There wasn't a golf course back then, for example. Another pop-up was was the BCN report that was um, that went public last spring. I had to write about that, and that made a great story. All about the uh, the importance of our green space here in Northeast Illinois. Now a few extra slides on this one. One of my favorite pop-ups. Um, it's about a lady in Yorkville who had some interesting visitors to her backyard. Does anybody else remember this? It was uh, June of 2014 when these nine black-bellied whistling ducks descended upon her yard and started using her bird feeders. And they stayed for about 10 days. Most people were able to go see them. This is her, Irene Kaufman's her name almost 10 years ago. And uh, I had to go there twice, once to see the birds and then back again three days later to interview Irene because it was such a fun story. Obviously she was interested in birds because you can see by the feeders, but she had never heard of such a thing as people, you know, she couldn't believe the reaction when word got out about these these whistling ducks, but she loved it. She was so accommodating and so happy for all the visitors that it, it just made a great, it was a people story as much as a bird story. There's some of those uh, ducks under her feeder. There were nine of them. And she had a, you know, a guest book out in the driveway. Here's somebody signing that. And I think, I think there were over 200 names on the guest book by the time it was over. Wonderful, uh, wonderful story. And things like the guest book and stakeouts. I mean, these these are things I look for when I'm writing a column. It's It's more than just the birds and the rarity of it or the chase. It's the little details like a notebook like this. And um, I always take a picture if there is one. Here's a sign. This one was outside a home in Lyle. Do you remember this? A few years ago, there was a Rufus hummingbird in December. This is the bird outside their home. I, I'm sorry, this is the sign outside their home in the driveway. I just love little things like this. And generally the stories of welcoming homeowners are are, are good because they're fascinated by the whole birding community that suddenly descends on their doorstep. This is a sign I saw up at Saks Zimbog. Little typo there, but cute sign. Another accommodating homeowner. And finally, um, this one is from, do, some of you may remember Kate Hopkins in Warrenville. I, she was a member of the club. I think she moved away though, but there was a spotted towie in her side yard that everybody went to see. She was happy to have us. But I love this sign because she wrote it from a bird perspective. Looking, says, looking for me, feel free to wander the yard. I've been spotted three times this week under the feeder on the south side of the house. And the bird even drew a map. This was taped to her front door. Little details like this you know, make a good story. Now, of course, I listed people as one of the other um, 
favorite topics of my columns, and I've had some good ones. Some of you might have seen this about Al Stokey. I think this was in 2001. If you don't know Al, he's the most prolific birder in these parts. He's out there birding every day. If you subscribe to iBet, you know this. He posts every day about what he sees and where he went. And he also, like like my columns, he includes a lot of other fun details, like where he had lunch and funny license plates he saw. He keeps track of it all. If you recognize this picture, um, this was taken down at Hidden Lake Forest Preserve. That's the bridge behind him. And I made this prop. I admit it, I created this prop for Al. That great Kiskity down in Shanahan, Shanahan was his 400th Illinois bird. So I thought, you know, we should celebrate that. He, he was happy to accommodate. He was happy to get that bird. What a 400th bird. I mean, there are only, I think, less than a dozen birders who have seen 400 birds in Illinois. And um, Al Stokey's in the club. This was a story way back in 2012 about the Deese brothers, Graham and Henry. A lot of you probably know them. They look a little different now. That was a fun story too. When I get a chance, when I have the opportunity, I do like to write about young birders. That's Graham on the left and Henry on the right. Here's another young birder story. This is um, Gracie McMahon was the ABA's 2020 Young Birder of the Year. And she lives in Rockford. So I got to meet her just by Zoom um, at a Young Birder Symposium where got, uh, Ken Kaufman was the keynote speaker. And after that conference, I followed up and did a little story on it. Those rocks are things she painted and hid in certain places. Well, not too, she didn't hide them too much, but she placed them around her community. Um, as a public awareness project. This is Ray Feld. He's a volunteer at Cantini and he takes care of our Purple Martin colony. Did a story about Ray back in the early, oh, I don't know, about 2010, one of my earlier columns in the Herald. There he is giving his Purple Martins 101 seminar, which he's done every year and continues continues to do for us. It's it's a great guy and a really hard worker who loves the loves the Martins and the Bluebirds. Along with his wife Cecilia, they do a great job here. I'm sure nobody knows this guy. This was a story about Kyle Wichter back in August 2016. He looks about the same. This is Carrie Ann Dubina on a story about Fuller's Bird Fridays. The DuPage Forest Preserve has these bird outings every spring where they go to a different preserve every Friday. Hopefully they'll do that again this year. And it's a great chance to get out and see different places you might not have been before. This picture was taken at Elson's Hill Oh, here I am with Noah Stricker. This was at the Peggy Notabare Museum. I don't know if any of you also went down there. He was talking about his new book, Birding Without Borders, which um, really, really good book. He's a gifted writer. I was thrilled to meet him and he signed my book here. I think I counted up about 15 columns have been devoted to books. And um, this book was one of them. And Birding Without Borders, hands down, it was being my top five birding books. I recommend it highly if you haven't read it already. Who remembers Fillmore Dryden? I'll bet a bunch of you do. He, this story, Leader of the Patch, um, all about Fillmore and his almost daily bird walks over at McKee Marsh. 
he knew the, every inch of that property. It was um, truly his happy place. And for a couple of years there, he could take you, he could show you a Northern Shrike anytime, uh, any day in the winter. I think he had that one tied down. He even knew where it stored its food. Here's the picture that ran in the paper, and I'll bet some of you recognize some uh, faces behind Fillmore there. See Nancy and Joan, Glenn, Olivia on the far right. Oh, and Leslie in the black hat. That might be John Sabula way in the background. I'm not sure, but that was a fun story to do too. It's it's interesting to talk to someone who just knows a piece of property and is and, and bird goes birding there day after day after day. This was a story about the the uh, Mississippi kites out in Rockford, and it wasn't strictly speaking a people story, but I did get to meet Dan Williams for the first time. Um, there he is. He was the one who. He was kind of your host. If you went to Rockford and wanted to see a Mississippi kite back then, it was 2013. He would be happy to show it to you in the neighborhoods. Um, and by the way, this photo has a byline of Jay Ryder. My son took this photo when he was 12 years old. <laughs> he used to go on a lot of these birding adventures with me. This was a story about the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival. I've written about that festival a couple of times because it's it's one of my favorites. And part of the reason is the people over there are just fabulous. It's well organized and um, always a good time. I'm standing here with Christina Nowski and one of her creations, a Cerulean Warbler painting that she did. She's so talented. She's the a resident artist of the festival. So every year, Christina creates the official poster and she has her artwork on sale there. Christina used to come on bird walks with her mom when she was, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old, really little. Some of the earliest Cantini bird walks I remember, um, Christina was on them with her mom. So now she lives over in Indiana. And I'll bet a lot of you know Vern Clean. Um, I wrote about his hummingbird festival down at Camp Sagawa one year. Took this picture there. Yeah, this was October, uh, September 2017. This guy is, you know, nationally known as a bird bander, like one of the best. He's probably birded, if not the most hummingbirds of anyone else um, close to it. And a great guy, a good instructor as well. This was last spring um, when I went on the, uh, uh, what they call it, Luna Palooza, Luna Palooza, sorry, <laughs> in Lake County, which was really a fun day with uh, our leader, David Johnson, who is known as the Loon Ranger. So again, a story, this was a story about an outing, but it kind of revolved around David because this whole, this whole up. Uh, Adventure is really his thing every spring. I highly recommend that you go on it if you haven't been out there already. We did see a lot of loons. It's pretty foggy in this picture. Visibility was tough at times, but um, it was a great day. And Dan was really a good leader. This is our group. Dan's on the, I'm sorry, David is on the far left. I'm in the back right there. It was nice. There were two kids on the on the trip. And they're holding a loon carved and painted by my dad. It was our mascot of the day. We took it everywhere, even on when we went to lunch at a place called Looney's Pub. <laughs> we set that uh, decoy right in the middle of our table. And you know, um, this one was a toughie. It, it it was about a person and it, it just, I guess, goes to show nothing is off limits when it comes to words on birds. I It was something I felt I had to write about. Um, and I did. 
Fox Ellis and Jim Herkert from the Illinois Audubon Society were very helpful in helping me do this story, which was kind of unlike any other I'd ever done. And then finally, in the people category, I got to mention my parents. Um, I wrote this one in April 2021. There they are in the middle. They had passed away on back-to-back -back days just three months before this column. So they were gone at this point. It was not so easy to write, but I'm glad I did. You know, they They meant so much to me. And helped me get started in birding in a way. So if not for them, I probably wouldn't be writing about birds and watching birds all the time. That picture in the lower right is not so great, but that's me and dad down at Dry Tortugas back in 2001. So they really did inspire me and uh, yeah, it was, Sad, but also inspirational. Tips and information, that's the next category. And information includes places to go birding. So Medewin's obviously a good candidate for that. This is one of the very early columns. Yeah, July, 2004. This is about a trip down state to see the prairie chickens. Jackie Bowman took that picture. That was a really fun trip. If you haven't been down there, down by Effingham, do go. It's it's well worth it. And if you've never seen a greater prairie chicken, that's your basically your only opportunity in Illinois. I wrote about Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge shortly after it became designated as such. This story was, uh, I'm looking for a date. Can't quite see, oh, 2014. That's a good place to go. A few more bits of advice. Binoculars, it's always a good topic. Feeders. 12 tips. I'd almost forgotten I wrote this um, when I was looking through my notebooks. I'm going to read off some of the 12 tips because they aren't, they maybe aren't what you would think. This was fun, fun to put together. Number one, you'll get some funny looks. Number two, age doesn't matter. Number three, decent binoculars are available for $125 or less. Number four, this isn't so hard. <laughs> Number five, birds are predictable. Number six, you can you can bird any way you want. Number seven, the more you want to see a bird, the better your chances of seeing it. Now I was thinking about that one the other day, and I'm not sure I had that right, because we've all been out there before when we want to see a bird so badly, <laughs> and then we don't see it. You almost feel like you're jinxing yourself the more you want to see it. But the point I was making in this column was that um, the more you want to see it, the more you're going to go for it. You know, if you don't see uh, a lease bittern, for example, the first time, but you know where they're being seen, you just go back and you go back and maybe the third or fourth time you'll finally see that lease bittern. Or maybe it's a northern shrike at Donata. But you know what I mean. It's um, you got to be persistent. And that was the point I was making there. Number eight, nemesis birds will haunt you. Number nine, sometimes the bird gets away and you don't see it. Number 10, the honor system applies. Number 11, ethics matter. And number 12, we are all conservationists. And a lot of those tips obviously apply to more than just beginning birders. This was a more recent, much more recent column about Merlin, which I was kind of a late adopter and now now I'm hooked on it. I wouldn't think of not using it. But um, I've talked to a lot of non-birders or maybe beginning birders about Merlin who brought it up. And 
they're kind of hooked on it too. They like going out on their back patio, turning it on and just seeing what it says. I think it's a great uh, um, entry into the hobby. It, it kind of makes it makes birding cool for people that thought maybe it wasn't so cool. Diary entries are another category. Um, if you've been a regular reader, you know that I write a lot about my own adventures and my own, well, in this case, a backyard milestone. This was about finally seeing my 100th bird in the yard, which was a common yellow throat. Let's see, 2006 that was. I think I'm up to 122 now. This was a story about finally uh, seeing my 500th life bird. And this was that varied thrush up in Evanston. I'll bet a lot of you went to see it as well. Um, Jackie Bowman lent me that photo. The funny thing about this, this bird for me, I mean, it, it was very meaningful because it was number 500, but only about four or five months before I had been in the Pacific Northwest prime habitat for varied thrush and I couldn't find one. <laughs> I never saw a varied thrush on that trip. So wouldn't you know it, I get my lifer varied thrush, my 500th bird in Evanston in the winter in a standing in a cold alley all by myself, just waiting and waiting. <laughs> and this was about um, finally seeing one of my ultimate nemesis birds, the worm-eating warbler. And I should point out when I when I look at this, the first thing I see is that headline and I don't make up the headlines, folks. I submit a headline and I usually submit a subhead as well, but the Daily Herald has their own headline writer. So I never really know what's gonna appear on top of my story. This would not have been my first choice. I think it's a little too dramatic, but um, it was a, a momentous occasion. I looked and looked and looked for a worm-eating warbler in so many places and never got lucky with it. So uh, finally happened at Indiana Dunes. And that was, uh, can't see the, that was June, 2017. The festival was in May. Still love that bird. The funny thing about that being my nemesis bird is I'd actually held one in my hand before. The uh, the problem was it was dead. I was walking to work at Tribune many, many years ago, and I found a worm-eating warbler on the sidewalk that had collided with a building. Um, I knew what it was right away, and I picked it up. It was clearly dead, and I took it to work, put it in the freezer, and the field museum came and picked it up a day or two later. I can still visit that bird if I want to down at the field museum. They have it, but... So that's as close as I had ever come to seeing a real one, a live one. Most of you might know, or those who read my stuff probably have seen a lot of references to baseball. <laughs> Been on a lot of baseball road trips as well as birding trips. And um, so you'll see that, but this is another headline I didn't make up, trust me. The Herald seems to have a thing about the word foul. They use it way, way too often, but that's another story. Then finally, this was a this was a trip in Florida around um, Lake Okeechobee in the middle of Florida, which is part of the state. Not too many people go, but it's it's wonderful for birding. Um, I was there with a Audubon group from Hendry Glades, Hendry Glades Audubon. Storm treatment, stormwater treatment area number five. Sounds kind of scary, but it's wide open. It's like a ranch type habitat, you know, with a lot of water, obviously, and really, really good place to bird. And this was the target for me anyway. This was what I really wanted to see the most, crested caracara. And sure enough, we did. This one uh, looks like it just finished off a a coot. But I was really happy to see that bird and I believe it that day was my dad's 86th birthday.
Here's another diary entry. Um, I was able to combine a story about watching chimney swifts out in Elgin at Abbott Middle School. That's that chimney picture in the middle. And then a few weeks before that, I'd been out to Portland, Oregon for a wedding that, and went to that school in the upper right corner there where they had Vox's Swift or maybe it's Vos Swift. I'm not sure of the pronunciation. I should have checked that, but that was a lifer for me. And they were pouring out of the chimney in the morning in that case. And um, just spectacular, really made an impression. And I came back and wrote about it. Now, the ultimate diary entry was this trip to Saxe Zimbabwe back in, checking my notes here. This was February, 2026, 2016, I'm sorry, 2016. In the picture, Roger and Diane, upper left, Joan and Ed in the upper right, and then that's me and Chuck Berman in the front. We look pretty happy, but believe me, we were really cold at this moment. I don't know how we all managed to smile. <laughs> oh, I guess we didn't. This is Chuck on the bus. The bus itself was was probably no more than 20 degrees. And uh, it was fun, though. Really a great trip. And the best thing about that story was um, it ended so well. We had, well, this is a porcupine, not what I thought I was going to show. Sorry. I thought I had a picture of a great gray owl here. But we were at the end of our second day of the festival. It was Saturday evening. We're leaving the next morning and we still hadn't seen a great gray owl. And it, we're driving around the roads in the bog. We decided to skip the keynote dinner. We're tired, we're hungry, but we really wanted to give ourselves every opportunity to see a great gray owl. And we're running out of daylight. And sure enough, we saw some birders, some cars pulled over on the road up ahead. We knew that was a good sign. And we got out of the car and sure enough, they were watching a great gray owl not too far off. And the light was still okay. So we got to see it after all, just in the nick of time. And that for me was a lifer. And obviously porcupine too. That was a bonus. I didn't expect to see a porcupine. This was a trip last, uh, about a year ago during the holidays out in Napa Valley. And I turned that into a column. The red-breasted sapsucker there in the middle was a life bird for me. And, and so was the California quail. This is a case where I didn't have any decent pictures of my own. So I went on Flickr and started looking up. Um, I found I just started looking up birds. And this is how it works a lot of times. If I don't have a good photo and nobody I know has a good photo, I go on Flickr. And I find the very best photos I can find. And then I write to the photographer and ask permission to borrow them. And nine out of 10 times, they say, they say yes. Um, it's amazing. They're so generous and happy to share when they know what I'm doing, when they know what it's for. And of course, I send them a link to the column when it comes out and a hard copy if they want one. And uh, they're usually very happy to participate. This is a case where all three of these California photos were by the same guy. And they're all excellent. You know, without the photos, this story would not have nearly the impact. And then I think this is my last so-called diary entry column where I just happened to notice red-eyed vireos and Swainson thrushes feasting in our magnolia tree on the side yard. And um, day after day after day in September, a couple of years ago. And it made a good story. At least I thought so. And as I mentioned earlier, the, my column year always ends with the birding year in review. Um, kind of a recap of all the things that happened bird-related in the past year. They might be bird sightings, but it might also be bird-related news. Um, this is one from 2020. And that big picture on top, those are all the people down in Shanahan looking for the great Kiskadee. 
And of course, about a week after that bird, there was a Western tanager in the same area. This was the 2021 year end review. Nice picture of the stilt there by uh, Dory, who I think is on the call tonight. And this is my most, most recent column in December, about 2022. This is a case too where, you know, nobody had, nobody I could locate locally had a decent picture of the painted red start that was seen in Lake County last August. So I had to reach, I went to Flickr and found a good photo and first try the guy said, yeah, happy to share. So that was really nice. I mean, a bird like that, you just you just have to have a good picture if you're going to talk about a rare bird like that. Discovered by Jeff Bilski, by the way. So I've I've talked a lot about photos, and I can't say it enough. They are so important. You know, these Daily Herald columns allow for color photos, and I always try to have two or three good ones, and I get a lot of help on that. These are just some of the key contributors I want to call out tonight. They've all been so generous with their images and so trust trustful, which means a lot to me. And it it um, it it makes my work a whole lot have a whole lot more impact. I'm sure. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of readers just look at the photos and captions, and that's all they read. <laughs> but it's been great. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much. I'm not quite sure why I threw this one in there. It's um, <laughs> I guess it was to remind myself that I'm 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 an intermediate birder at best. I'm not an ace birder. I'm just a guy that likes to write about it, about birds and birding. And oh, I know the key was that word hobbies. I mean, for me. Birding is a hobby for me, but writing the column is such a huge part of that hobby. I mean, I can't imagine one without the other. Obviously, I have to be a birder to, to have content and know what to write about, but the hobby, the writing itself, the column is, uh, has become such a big passion of mine. And, you know, I say it started with one goal in mind, really, and that was to raise public awareness about birds and, and birding and to scratch an itch because I knew I wanted to write. But it was really about making more people aware, especially about the amazing things they can see right outside their own door. Um, people watch their feeders, but they might not look so carefully at their trees and shrubs in the month of May, for example. And once they realize how much is out there and how accessible it really is, um, well, I like to say that hopefully the column has created a few new birders. And if it has, then I consider it a, a success because we can always use more birders. Um, we all know that if you're a birder, you're probably a conservationist. You're probably concerned about the environment. And so we need more birders, especially young birders. And um, that's part of what writing the column is all about. If it's if it's doing a little bit of that and creating more interest, then I'm a happy reporter. So that's it. Um, one more time, that's, if you don't receive the Herald at home, and I know a lot of you don't, you can see the column on dailyherald.com, although I think you're somewhat limited how many times you can visit the site without having to pay for it. But they have a pretty... You can be an online reader only, and it's pretty inexpensive. Um, and then, as I said before, if you wanted to see my columns, go to the website, wordsonbirds.com. That's where I put every column. That's all it's for is a reservoir for all the columns, all 210 of them. And that's it for tonight. Um, thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate it. And again, thanks for all of you out there who have helped me out with the column in the past. I much appreciate your help. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate it.
Um, those of you at home, if you notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. If you want to show Jeff your appreciation, you can hit that. Uh, Jeff, you can unsubscribe if you like. Stop share. Okay. Well, we didn't lose too many. <laughs> we'll, we'll invite... Uh, I thought there'd be maybe 10 people still on the call. <laughs> no, no, there's almost 60. So uh, one question that came in while you were speaking about the, uh, the book, book Burning Without Borders, uh, question was from uh, Peter, what are some of the other top five books that you have read? Oh, okay. Well, Kingbird Highway for sure. I think we've all I'll bet half of us half of us has probably read Kingbird Highway by Ken Kaufman. Um, I love the Grail Bird about the ivory bill woodpecker, the rediscovery of the ivory bill woodpecker, at least alleged rediscovery. It's called the Grail Bird. Um, I love the bio. There's a biography about Roger Tory Peterson I really like called the Bird Watcher, I think, or just Bird Watcher. And, oh, The Big Year, of course, The Big Year. Better than the movie. And they were both really good. So those would be some of my faves. Great, thank you. I haven't seen a really good book yet about baseball and birding, but if it ever comes <laughs> out, maybe I should try to write it. Yeah. Uh, other questions out there? Maybe I'll have a... Question for Jeff while, I, while we have them online. Type it in your chat if you can. So I, I guess uh, I'll follow up a question, Jeff. Um, how much longer are you going to keep doing this? Hopefully a long time. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I'm not running out of ideas, mm -hmm. and it'll be be easier once I retire. I mean, I'm only a year or two away from retiring and then I'll have a lot more time to devote to it. More time to go out birding and gathering content. <laughs> One thing about writing is, you know, I probably, any given column, maybe not the real early ones because they were so short, but between writing the column, gathering the images, rewriting the column, proofreading, I mean, Every column is probably at least 10 hours. Um, and when you're working full time, you know, that's, that means you're usually going to be writing that. I'm usually going to be doing it on weekends. And I'm very much a morning person. I can't stay up much past nine. So uh, <laughs> that means I, I lose out on a lot of birding time because I'm writing on weekend mornings. Um, so it does. You know, it's a sacrifice in a way, but I love it. And I I will go birding and I'll be able to have more time to write the column when I retire. When someone uh, was curious about the site that you mentioned related to Al Stokey, and uh, that was I bet. And uh, Steve was monitoring the questions and put a link to. Uh, the I bet, uh, I don't know, blog or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, for Let's those serve. that are out there, if you want to find the uh, the meeting chat for those of you watching um, and click on that and you can you can sign up for that, uh, that daily post. You know, speaking of I bet, I, I should mention quickly that reading I bet, reading... Um the daily eBird rare bird reports. I get them for, I get the one for DuPage County and the one for Illinois. And then all the, uh, the group me chats going on, not to mention, you know, bird watching digest, bird watching magazine. Um, those are great sources. I get a lot of my ideas from those too. I mean, just keeping up with all that. There's, there's a lot of content out there that it sparks ideas for me. Yeah. Steve uh, asks, 
if you can recall any interesting feedback you've had to some of your uh, articles. Hmm. Well, I, you might think I get a lot of feedback, but I, I sure don't. I really don't. Um, I like to go on the Daily Herald website and scroll to the bottom of my column and see if anyone's left a comment. And it's it's very rare I ever see one. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the column, it does say you can reach me through my blog. And so I know that some people go to the blog and they find my email there. So I get some direct emails. And they're usually about, you know, what you would expect, bird problems. <laughs> the cardinal just keeps pecking at my window or, um, you know, the woodpeckers are ruining my siding. There's a lot of stuff like that. Every now and then there's a, somebody will attach a, a photo and just ask for an ID. And what is this? And many, many times it's such a crappy photo. I can't even make out, you know, what family of birds it's in, let alone the species. <laughs> yeah. But I'm polite about it, but, you know, I, I, I love feedback, but I just can't tell you I get a lot. Well, let me give you some feedback from our viewing members here. We have uh, someone uh, said, uh, makes our Daily Herald subscription worthwhile. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for turning people on to birds and caring for them. Enjoyed your talk and your articles. Great presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. It goes on and on. So our members certainly appreciate what you do for us and your presentation tonight. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Jeff, you. For, for taking the time to put that together and sharing with DuPage Birding Club. You're welcome. Thank hey. you. I appreciate hey, it. If I could add one more comment, Jeff. I think you've just been a wonderful evangelist for birding and interest in birds because lots of people come to our club because they've, you know, they've seen your columns and, you know, they mention you as a source, you know, uh, you know, when we ask, um, how did you hear about us? Um, so we appreciate the mentions many times for DuPage Birding Club. And I, I just think you've been a wonderful evangelist for the, for the, for the, I don't want to call it a hobby for the for the passion of birding. So thank, oh, thank you. you. Well, that's nice. Nice to hear that. I appreciate it. 